Hello and welcome back to AP World History Modern. Today we are going to begin Unit 7.1. Going to be our first of two days on this uh, unit. Um, looking at shifting power after the 1900s. Right? And, uh, and our learning objective is going to be to explain how internal and external factors contributed to change in various states after, after 1900. And there's a look at our, at our uh, curriculum. All right. Um, specifically today, we're going to be kind of focusing in on the Ottomans. I'm going to do a kind of spend some time on the Ottomans. All right. But first thing we, I want to just mention real quick is welcome to time period four. It doesn't really mean anything. What you need to know, though, is that this is 1900 to present. Um, so this is the last of our time periods. And you'll notice the, uh, the, time grid, the time grid here, created by Mr. Freeman, um, it's a little denser than, than a normal time grid is, but it makes sense because uh, this last time period, 1900 to present, is a much uh, denser um, time period. Um, it's also given more weight by the college board on the AP exam, and that's why we see it broken up into three separate units. Uh, instead of the normal two, like we saw with the, the previous three time periods. So we're going to be uh, spending you know, spending uh, the rest of our year by uh, looking at this time period, 1900, 1900 to present. Uh, and of course, Unit 7, our, our first uh, unit for this time period is going to be on global conflicts. So largely focusing in on, you know, what's leading up to World War One, World War One, what happens after World War One um you know and then into world war ii all right so in the kind of immediate aftermath of that so that's what we're going to be dealing with for this unit all right and then uh you know and then kind of transitioning to decolonization in the next unit and then things like green revolution and globalization more economic stuff in uh in the last unit all right so uh so yes welcome to Walk into the contemporary period of AP World History, 1900 to present. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, Turkey or the transition from the Ottoman Empire uh, to Turkey. And of course, the, you know, to understand that transition, it's always a good idea to, to be aware of, of uh, you know, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, right? Ataturk, a huge. A, you know, a huge force in, uh, in this transition. Um, you know, in the 20th century is full of nationalist leaders that we're going to be looking at this year. So if you want to kind of create little categories of analysis around these nationalist leaders, um, you know, we could, we could easily do this, right? So some nationalist leaders are like Kamal Ataturk um, in that they advocate westernization, uh, modernization, and secularization, right? So just kind of make sure, I'm assuming you know what modernization means. We've used that word before in talking about the Meiji period of Japan. Um, I'm assuming you know what westernization means, emulating the cultural practices and, and uh, economic techniques of the, you know, of, of the West, right? So Europeans, the United States, right, et cetera. And, uh, but secularization might be a word that you're not familiar with. Secularization or secular refers to, uh, you know, non-religious or separating uh, government and politics from religion. You know, so secular, non-religious, profane means religious, right? So the secular versus the profane. So we see Ataturk as an example of a, a secular, right, modernizer, Right of uh, the former Ottoman Empire, modern day Turkey, um, right Westernization. All right, so you know, and you can kind of contrast him to the person that you probably are more familiar with, um, you know, which is Gandhi. And uh, it's not that Gandhi did not own a suit, right? Gandhi certainly owned a suit when when he went to England and uh, went to law school. Uh, he certainly owned a suit when he was working as a lawyer in South Africa. Uh, representing South Asians, um, but you know during during the First World War when he goes from South Africa back to South Asia, um, you know to join the nationalist movement, you know this is when he this is when he abandons the suit, right? And uh, adons kind of that traditional temple garb, um, you know, 
celebrates, you know, and, and really kind of practices right, um, you know, a lot of kind of key aspects of Hinduism. Um, right. So, so when we'll, we'll talk about that at a later time, but, uh, but yeah, there's different forms of nationalism, those that reject, um, Westernization, right. Those that reject, you know, uh, um, you know, their, their former colonial authorities and, uh, you know, and trying to celebrate, you know, their culture that existed before, uh, that time period. And then there's those who, who embrace Westernization and secularization, um, so that's kind of ways that you could possibly categorize different nationalist movements. All right, so, but we're talking about Ataturk, right? Uh, you know, and, and looking at this uh, photograph from a wedding, you could, this is indistinguishable from, from a wedding you might see anywhere in Europe or the United States from this time period. All right, so but let's talk real quick about, you, you know, what happens in the Ottoman Empire. And, and this change from the Ottomans to, to what eventually becomes Turkey. Um, and first thing I just want to start here with, if you look at this date here, 1913, what was the Ottoman Empire? And you can see it running through the western part of the Arabian Peninsula, so controlling Mecca, um, right into the Tigris Euphrates River Valleys. Um, but you notice that it doesn't really control much else, you know, um, Island of Crete. Uh, but not much to the west of what is Istanbul, right? So uh, historically, we think of the Ottoman Empire, uh, North Africa would be there, um, and of course, much of, of Southeast Europe would be there. But notice, by the time we get to World War I, um, there's already a kind of a tremendous amount of what used to be the Ottoman Empire um, gone, right? And then, of course, we can see what happens in the immediate aftermath of of the first world war all right so you know when looking at this let's just kind of break this down a little bit and kind of make sure we are right, we're kind of breaking this down so all right where are we here right there so ottoman empire ottoman empire and we are transitioning here to Right, what we would call today Turkey. Right, and of course, we're going to be focusing in on specifically uh, Kemal Ataturk. Right, so let's just kind of go back one right here. Um, just kind of make sure we you can see that, okay? So Now, Ataturk. All right, let me pop that back up. All right, so, so this is our kind of nationalist leader that we're going to be focusing in on as we kind of make that transition from the Ottoman to, to Turkey. All right, all right, so a couple things because our learning objective today is asking us to break down um some of the external factors external factors right and some of our internal factors right some of our internal factors so as far as our external factors are concerned um you know some of the some of the things that we just saw on that map is right, a very real loss Right, loss of land, right, a very real loss of land, and some of the kind of examples that we, you know, that we've already talked about in this class, is uh, you know, in the 1820s we see uh, Greek independence, <clears throat> right? Greek independence will, you know, will take place, will occur. Uh, we also see, I'm just going to put here by the 1840s. And I'm going to put by the 1840s because I am not an expert on Egyptian history, um, you know, but based on what I know from Egypt, 
Um, you know, I, I know that by the 1840s, Egypt is acting as an independent sovereign state. Uh, before that, you know, the, the 1890s, we see the Mamluks, right, uh, you know, asserting control. Uh, the French will come in in, you know, the very last year or two of the 1890s uh, and take over. And they'll be there for about three or four years. And then, and then they will leave. And then the Ottomans will send, and send in Muhammad Ali. Um, you know, and we know that Muhammad Ali does, you know, uh, does still um, do a lot of operations for the Ottomans. I mean, we, we, we know the, uh, you know, they will retake, um, you know, the city of Mecca, right, in the late 18 teens, um, you know, from the Sauds. And, uh, you know, so where that, where that actual line is, you know, is, uh, is broken, I'm, I'm not 100% positive myself. I know Muhammad Ali sends, sends troops to help the Ottomans, uh, you know, during the Greek independent, you know, the Greek independence war, um, you know, and that's in the, the mid 1820s that that takes place, you know, but by the time we get to the late 1830s, early 1840s, um, you know, we, we see Egypt making moves on Istanbul and the British being forced to intervene, um, you know, on behalf of the Ottomans uh, to protect it. So, you know, really by 1840, 1839 to 41, um, you know, we see, we see Egypt kind of acting independent. So anyway, um, kind of on a tangent there, so I apologize. But, uh, right, so, so we see that taking place. Um, there's also a bunch of other things happening in, and let's just kind of put our date there, um, 1878, because there's a lot of things going on in 1878. Let me just kind of go to, go to a slide here and, and talk about some of this. All right, so so in 1878, right, we're seeing a uh, you know kind of a, a Slavic movement that goes back to the a couple of years before uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and they're getting support from Montenegro and Serbia. Um, so by 1878, um, you know we're seeing Austria-Hungary right taking over or at least occupying it. All right, so Bosnia, Herzegovina. Right, Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, Austria, Hungary. And I have a tendency to write AH. Um, so I better write that in there. Austria, Hungary. Right, Austria, Hungary will uh, right, we'll, we'll take it over. Um, and then by 1908. They will officially, Austria Hungary will annex it. Right? They will officially uh, annex it um, and make it part of their state. Right? Now, the question, uh, the obvious question is, and obviously uh, most, most students know this, why, you know, why does it matter that in 1908, um, you know, the Bosnia is annexed? Um, you know, Bosnia is annexed by. By the Austrian Hungarian Empire, by the Habsburgs. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, most students are pretty quick to be able to answer, you know, isn't that what causes World War I or has something to do with what starts World War I? And, and the answer is yes, right? So officially annexed in 1908, and we see uh, in, in June of 1914, uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the, uh, the heir apparent to the Habsburg throne. Uh, is visiting Sarajevo, uh, you know, with his wife, and uh, and they will eventually both be assassinated, be, will be killed, um, right? By, you know, I generally ask by whom, um, and uh, in in most students are are pretty aware uh, that it was a uh, you know a a Serbian. Um, some say, you know, some even know that he's uh, you know that. Percep is from the Black Hand. It's a Serbian Serbian group, and sometimes students will say a Serbian terrorist group. Sometimes they'll say a Serbian nationalist group, uh, and of course, irregardless of, of what a student says in that situation, it's a good good little time to point out um, you know perception and point of view. So um, you know, Percep and the Black Hand were definitely a nationalist group. If you are, you know. Uh, a pan-Slav, uh, pro-Serbian independence 
person. Uh, and they're definitely a terrorist organization if you are a you know, supporter of the Habsburgs um, in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. All right, so in 1878, we see Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, <clears throat> we see, you know, uh, we see Romania, right? And we see, um, right, declared as an autonomous state, Bulgaria, right? So Bulgaria, um, you know, so they're going to get, they're going to be recognized as autonomous in 1898 and then actual independence is in is in 1908 the same year that the uh the Habsburgs um you know the Habsburgs will annex Bosnia all right so uh just kind of show you kind of where I ended up with that all right so there you go so so um, you know massive loss of land right is, is taking place um, even before, right, even before, uh, you know, World War I happens. Um, and then, of course, after World War I happens, right, to kind of just switch back now, um, you know, after World War I happens, right, kind of get to 1920, um, and you see all of these lands, right, so the western part of the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, right, the land around the Tigris and Euphrates River Valleys, they're they're going to be lost um, after after World War One, all right. So and then uh, and then there's going to be an immediate war against the Greeks in the aftermath of World War One, and then eventually uh, Ataturk, um, you know, coming to power and then establishing what are the kind of normal borders um, here. All right. So because of uh, you know because of loss of land, we probably need to distinguish this. Um, all right, so let's just kind of put a post World War One, right? Post World War One, um, Mesopotamia, All right? So that's the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys, All right? That is lost. Uh, Western Arabian Peninsula. So the city of Mecca. All right. So you know, and of course, this is this uh, is is a massively significant thing psychologically. You know, it's it's not just that they're losing land, but they've also lost the most important city, lost control of the most most important city within Islam. Um, you know, and if I throw in, you know, also they lose Palestine. Right? They lose all three of the most important cities, Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem, um, you know, all lost. So when we talk about Ataturk when he comes to power, he never never really makes an attempt to, to regain this land. Um, you, know, these are, you know, these are simply allowed to, to go. Um, right? All right, then you've got a, a ton of internal factors as well, right? So, um, and, and maybe one of the, you know, kind of one of the ways to kind of look at this is uh right is maybe just by saying a refugee crisis takes place um right so there is in the late 1800s right when we start talking about the loss of you know um southeast europe by the ottomans you know the question then becomes what happens to this muslim population that has been living there for the past you know seven eight hundred years um, you know, what happens to them? And, uh, you know, in, in the late 1800s, you know, so late 1800s through, let's just say, World War I, somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six million Muslims are displaced, killed, Right, and forced to relocate to Anatolian Peninsula, right where modern day or modern day Turkey is. Um, you know, and then 
while kind of continuing to talk about this, uh, post World War One, right? Post World War One, um, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of three hundred eighty thousand through about five hundred thousand Muslims forced out of Greece. Right to Turkey, you know, to the Anatolian Plateau. So, you know, some in the neighborhood of 400,000 ish people are going to be, uh, you know, forced out of Greece. Muslims are going to be forced out of Greece. Um, there is precipitation going on, though, in this situation, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 million Greeks are forced out of Turkey. All right, so we see this uh, kind of migration both ways. Uh, and, and there are a few moments in history where we see this take place as borders get changed and settled. Um, you know, probably the most famous example is going to be in 1947 with Pakistan and, and India. Um, we see that kind of massive swap around in, uh, in borders. All right, so that's, uh, you know, that's kind of the big, big migration thing um, in refugee crisis that happens. Um, all right, so, all right, let me scoot out of this real quick. Let's just kind of skim through a couple of these slides, just kind of give you, give you kind of what some of this is. All right, so insert Ataturk, right, kind of insert Ataturk into this situation, um, right? So when we talk about Ataturk, um, I simply want to make sure you understand the reforms, right, radically secularizing westernizing reforms that happen between 1923 and, and 1938 when he passes um, because they are extremely radical and, uh, and and there's a couple things that we need to kind of understand about this and and how it happens and why it happens um, for one thing if you understand what we just talked about uh, that the Ottoman Empire was a fraction of what it once was you know, kind of wrap your mind around the idea of, say, the United States losing all of its land west of the Mississippi River, and we're reduced to, you know, uh, you know what the United States used to be in you know, in the late 1700s, right? There's a there's a psychological impact of that. Um, you know, think about losing control of the three most important cities within Islam. You know, uh, Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem, right? Loss of that. You know, on top of the land, it's also massively symbolic and religious. Um, on top of that, think about the refugee crisis, the displacement um, of millions of people, right, that takes place. And there's really nothing that can be done about it. Um, you know, you factor in those kinds of conditions, you know, those kinds of things, um, you know, people are going to be willing to accept changes that, would be unthinkable under under other kind of situations, right? But of course, we also need to think about who's going to usher in those changes, um, and of course, insert uh, Ataturk, right? So Mustafa Kemal or Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, um, and he is a war hero, um, and a war hero from Gallipoli. Now, I know most of most of my students have never heard of Gallipoli before. Um, however, if you are, you know, if you're from from Turkey. Or if you are from Australia or New Zealand, you've definitely heard of Gallipoli before, um, right? So Gallipoli from, you know, from the Australian or New Zealand, the Anzac point of view is, uh, is, is something that every school child learns about in, in Australia and New Zealand, right? Uh, because of the sacrifices made there by the Anzacs. Um, you know, there is a film that was made about it called Gallipoli. Uh, starring a very young Mel Gibson, if you're interested in kind of period piece films, um, right? But Gallipoli is, and I, I was, I, what I do usually say in class is, you know, think about D-Day, you know, uh, and what every American kid knows about. Think about D-Day and the kind of, you know, we throw 150,000 troops um, at the beaches of Normandy, right? Both airborne and amphibious. Imagine if all those forces had been repelled right um most of them died and we never take a single beach 
right? We, you know, we don't, we don't keep the beach. Um, you know, this is what Gallipoli is for the Anzacs. Um, you know, the, the Anzac soldiers, the Australian New Zealand soldiers were ordered onto the beaches of Gallipoli uh, by the British, right? Commanded by the British. And, uh, you know, and, you know, and they were forcefully repelled. And of course, the hero from Gallipoli, um, you know, this is, this is Mustafa Kamel. This is Attica. Um, he, you know, he is a hero that emerges out of this period at a time when there's not much to celebrate for the Ottomans, right? So we have this a dynamic nationalist personality, um, you know, and he will usher in the reforms that he believes are necessary, um, you know, in order to to give um, the Turkish people back control of their own fate, uh, because. In the years leading up to World War One and during World War One, um, you know, and what was happening afterwards, it looked like they had lost control, right, of you know, of their own destiny. So reforms, right? So this will, and you can kind of see here, he won't try to kind of get back what was lost, um, you know, and then he initially begins in in 1924 by making a very major, major reform, eliminating the caliphate, right? So. I'm just gonna kind of put here two, right? Reforms, right? Reforms, right? Reforms by Ataturk, right? And sometimes I think Strayer refers to this as Kamalism. I think that's the, you know, you'll see it all kinds of different ways. So I'm gonna flip this over, right? Kind of. Repeat that. Number two, these are the reforms. Right. And really what we're talking about here is westernization, secular, right, non-religious, right, and modernization. Right. And there are a lot of them. All right. So let's kind of start off by saying like 1924, um, right, ends the caliphate. All right. So the caliphate had been in existence. I mean, really, once we start talking about after Muhammad dies in 632, we have the four rightly guided caliphs. We have the Umayyad caliphate. We have the Abbasid caliphate. When the Mongols destroy the Abbasid Caliphate, we have the Mamluks, and then they will establish a caliph. Um, you know, and then and then uh, and they will control Mecca, um, you know, from Egypt. And then with the rise of the Ottomans around 1518 or so, when the Mamluks are are conquered by the by the Ottomans, you know, the Ottomans will have a have the Caliphate right up until 1924. All right, so there's a Right, this is this is big. This is a major reform, right? That gets made, um, and then there's a you know a whole host of others, um, you know. And I'm gonna just kind of swap back and forth here with you. Again, let me do this. All right, so um, right, so we have a, a secular state, right? And you know, I usually kind of read this in class to kind of mentally prepare what we're about to talk about. A civilized international dress is worthy and appropriate for our nation. We will wear it, boots and shoes on our feet, trousers on our legs, uh, shirt and tie, jacket, waistcoat. Uh, and of course, to complete these, a covering with a brim on our heads. I want to make this clear. This head covering is called a hat. All right. So what is what is he talking about and why is he clarifying that point? Right, there are major reforms that are going to get made, right? So, in major kind of cultural traditions that are going to be banned, right? So, so let's kind of let's kind of just look through some of these real quick. So, changes the the, the Turkish alphabet from Arabic letters to to Roman ones, right? So that would be a good, uh, you know, that would be a good number two for you, right? So. You know, the, the, the Turkish alphabet had always been phonetically Turkish in Arabic, but you know, now they're switch, switching over to two Roman letters, uh, you know, so it would, it would read like or look very similar to German or French or Italian or English or French, right? Um, it mandates the, the call to prayer to be in Turkish rather than in Arabic, right? So he's not making Turkish language required inside the mosque, but outside the mosque. 
it becomes a, a requirement. All right. Um, closes all religious courts in schools. All right. Closes all the religious courts in schools. That'd be a good number four for you on your on your list. All right. Uh, abolishes the Ministry of Canon Law and Pious Foundations. The example in class I usually say is like if you're familiar with how the U.S. government is structured, where we have different cabinet departments in our government. You know, CAD, Department of Transportation, Department of Homeland Security, right? So this is an entire, uh, you know, this is an entire government sector um, that was abolished, right? So you don't need a, a Ministry of Canon Law, religious law, if, you know, if, uh, if the courts are not being run by the state. Um, list the ban on alcohol, right? List the ban on alcohol, um, Right, uh, adopts a Gregorian calendar in place of the Islamic calendar. So I always kind of make sure students know what the word Gregorian means, Gregorian calendar, right? So it's this is the calendar that we use in the United States, a kind of a Christian-based calendar. So this is the kind of the second major Christian calendar that was created after the Julian calendar, right? Uh, makes Sunday the day of rest, right? Kind of the traditional Christian day um, instead of Friday. Um, forbids the wearing of the fez, right? So what are we talking about here, right? Elimination of traditional cultural practices. Um, requires all Turks to choose a surname, right? Westernization. Um, and it's not that there wasn't opposition, right? It's simply opposition was banned, right? So and not just opposition was banned. Uh, leftist, you can insert the word socialist there. Um, leftist workers organizations were also banned right um, and of course Turkish nationalism was right had to be uh, prioritized over other nationalist claims that existed within uh, that take place within uh, you know the Middle East um, and of course one of these one of these nationalist um, things that pops up is Kurdish nationalism uh, during this time and of course the Kurds if you're not familiar with the Kurds, I, I think we talked about them in class uh, maybe once. We talked about Saladin, um, you know, of Kurdish origin, right? So the Kurds are, are an ethnic group or an ethnic minority group that exists within the Ottoman Empire, a little northern Syria, northern Iraq, um, right? So, and uh, they were not given a state, right? So for, for various reasons, right, which we can talk about Sykes-Picot later, uh, for various reasons, uh, you know, the Kurds, you know, live within the borders of other countries, and uh, and it's still an issue today, right? This is not an issue that has died, um, but Ataturk will kind of prevent um, any issues associated with that. All right, and then we're also going to get, you know, uh, so I, I guess by this point you're probably up to number twelve, uh, women's rights, right? We're going to see women's rights, um, you know. So we see that this is pre Ataturk, the 1917 marriage laws. Uh, but during that Turk, we see by 1930, um, you know, women are allowed to vote in local elections. Uh, 1934, women are women are allowed to vote in the national assembly elections, right? So we we see women's we see women's suffrage, all right. Um, all right. So by the time we get there, Turkish women appear in the streets without a veil. Um, you know, was was an object. Okay, so uh, right, so so what do we see as soon as women are given the right to vote? We see by 1935, we see uh, you know over a dozen women, these 18 women are are elected to to parliament. All right, so this is uh, you know why are we seeing these kinds of kind of gender equality movements taking place in Turkey, but we don't see like Saudi Arabia women given the right to vote until well after the year 2000. Right, this is Ataturk, Westernization, secularization, right? So one of the realities of emulating Western society, right? One of the realities is gender gender equality, um, right? So we, so we do see a movement towards that. So then the question becomes how much buy-in is there, right? How much do these legal reforms really matter? I mean, obviously there is buy-in if we have you know, well over a dozen women get elected in their very first opportunity. But, you know, how widespread is this? I always find this kind of an interesting passage coming out in 1929. Right, so, so if, please feel free to pause and read this. 
All right, so welcome back. Uh, so when we talk about this in class, you know, I simply ask, like, how do you how do you make sense of this passage with what, everything we just talked about, right? Um, are they compat Is this compatible with what we just learned about, and why or why not, right? And the obvious answer here is no, right? And most students are able to kind of you know kind of explain this by saying there's a reality of political reforms that are made. Um, and then there's a reality of cultural norms that that are continued, all right. And uh, and if you were able to pick up on that, then that's really good. Um, you know, to help clarify this, I usually use the example in the United States. I mean, we are in the year 2021 now. Uh, everywhere in the United States, we have same-sex marriage. Um, and you know, if I were to ask the question, is same-sex marriage accepted by everyone in the United States? Um, you know, most students are able to identify that there are some people who culturally have not accepted, um, you know, that practice simply because it is, you know, even though it's legally allowed, right? And this is what we're seeing take place here in Turkey. We have certain, you know, legal reforms that have been made, um, political changes that have been made, but we're seeing a continuity of some cultural beliefs, right? And this is another interesting passage, um, you know, that that kind of looks at the, you know, the, the situation that women, that women were in, um, a paradox, right? Women are encouraged to go into the workplace. Women are also encouraged to not go, not, not excel beyond their male peers uh, in that same workplace. Uh, women have, you know, cultural expectations within the house that don't change just because women are, are able to go work outside and they even encourage to work outside the house. Those, you know, these are, you know, this is a, a paradox in which, um, you know, still survives in the United States to this day. Um, you know, so not shocking to see that it exists in, in Turkey, um, you know, kind of at the moment in which, which women were first given rights. All right, so that's uh, probably a good stopping point for today. Um, so a few key takeaways, right? And we'll kind of go over these again tomorrow. Um, so as the world enters the 20th century, several major land empires, um, and then we're going to see within the first couple of decades, um, many of these empires collapse, right? And, uh, you know, so today we've been talking about the Ottomans, right? And tomorrow we'll look at Russia. Um, you're going to see, uh, you know, as well as, with this, a number of different peasant-based revolts, and I would encourage you to to look at my the website um, under the political crisis. Kind of just look up what you're watching right now. I would encourage you to read down through what happens in Mexico, um, right? And because uh, that is another kind of high probability uh, topic um, on the AP exam. All right, so that is all for today. Uh, Sapriati.